The history that I'm going to tell you is of Jesus. This channel will then probably be called the Blasphemous Channel. I want to talk about these missing years of Jesus. They're not the missing years at all. They're the boring years. Boring because Jesus had not taken his mantle. He was simply a growing young man experiencing the world and all things that were there. He had not taken his mantle. He was not performing sermons and miracles. There were no things that were written down at all about what he did because there was nothing to write. It was only later, as he approached his 30th year, that he began to see not only who he was, but what he could do and started to realize the mantle that he carried would change the earth. But not while he was growing up, not at all. This in itself is controversial, but what I'm going to tell you next is the blasphemous part. The man, Jesus, was not celibate. He was growing up like any other man, discovering the beauty of the things that God had given him and all humanity to discover. The idea of celibacy being something pure is a total and complete human construct. <laughs> celibacy, dear ones, creates dysfunction and unbalance. Do I have to tell you more? And you know this. My partner has a favorite saying that he has published. It is when a Christian minister was speaking before a number of young people. And the Christian minister said this. Sex is one of the most vile, horrible, dirty, filthy things on earth. And you should save it for somebody you love. <laughs> Unquote. <laughs> I would like to make a statement that I've said before. The intimacy between two human beings in love is designed and sacred and creates sacred energy beyond energy that you could create alone. It is designed for this reason. It brings love together. It's a, a pinnacle of beauty and it is proper and it is complete. And for you to have vilified it or anyone is a construct of human control. Jesus was not celibate. Let me tell you about what happened in the upper room. Now, I've discussed this before. I've even told you about the chalice before. Very controversial. But I want to enhance this just, just yet again. I want you to know something. This thing that is called the Last Supper was not set up as a special meal by Jesus with invitations to come on to this special meal, something special is going to happen. This was a Passover. This was a typical Passover meal to break unleavened bread. They were all Jews. This was something that they would normally do at this time. And the fact that they were all together yet again was not that unusual. But this was the last time. I told you before that of all of the reports of what Jesus said, it was almost all metaphoric. He was saying goodbye, but he was saying it in his own words so they would not be disturbed or they would not be upset. And they didn't understand it. They really didn't. Even when he broke bread and drank the wine in what is now called the First Communion, they just thought that this was a ceremony 
because he was who he was and they should honor him all his life in this fashion there was never one thought that he would be gone in a day not any of them got that even when the one who betrayed him left they didn't get it none of them really thought he was saying goodbye and one thing that you should really see is that Joseph was not there so the idea and I'll say it again the idea that someone would have taken the cup from Christ not knowing it was the Last Supper one of his followers would have put it in a bag and then sold it to Joseph later doesn't really make sense now does it where is that chalice today dear ones I will say it yet again it's on the ancient rubbish heap of dirty dishes. <laughs> the Holy Grail, dear ones, is what you carry within you, which is the love of God. The Holy Grail is the representation of what Christ taught, not an object to be found by King Arthur. And by the way, did you see his grave today? Did you see King Arthur's grave? Don't you find it interesting he's buried in several places? <laughs> I call this the convenient, abundant bones of King Arthur. Legend would live on, and it should live on, of the hero story. But what happened next, I want you to hear. When they put Jesus on the wood, and they crucified him all day long. Where were his disciples? Where were the apostles? They weren't there. Who was there? Under protocol, the ones who go there are family. For there will be no suspects if they're family. And what I mean by that, that the apostles, the disciples were shocked. They were in complete shock, even though they'd been told what they saw unfold in the streets was so awful, never expected. Even though he said goodbye, they didn't get it. Some of them went into hiding so they would be able to write later. They were afraid they would be associated if they gathered around as followers. They, they were not there. But the one who was, was Joseph, because he was his uncle. You see, things are self-evident. You don't have to prove these things through lineage and writings, because some things are self-evident. Mary from Magdala was there. She was family in some way as well. You figure that out. mother was there for a while Joseph remained and he remained and he remained now I've told you this before and I want you to understand something I'm going to give you a scenario and then I'm going to tell you that this is not secret I'm not revealing anything because what I'm about to tell you next is in the scrolls they are not published in your scripture they're in the scrolls you can find them they're documented and others have and it goes like this. Still on Jewish law today, it is against protocol to crucify after sundown. So Joseph knew that he would have to wait until sundown. And he and the helpers in the groups that were there to help, not family, would then remove the body and take it to the tomb. But something also happened. It's in the scrolls. There were dignitaries coming into town before sundown. And they wanted to remove the bodies sooner than they normally do. And they did in the scrolls. Joseph was there and took him off the wood. 
Now what next is important for you to hear is also in the scrolls. The tomb that he was taken to, whose was it? Tombs are expensive. They are purchased in advance either for the family or the individual, just as today some of you will purchase grave sites before your death. Joseph was an abundant man and he had purchased a tomb that was very close to Golgotha. He took his nephew off the wood and Joseph put him in his own tomb, the tomb of Joseph. He loved his nephew. He's probably one of the only men that knew him as well as he did. That's the story. Now what happened here is what I want to tell you. That is beautiful. That is believable. And there's very little proof. Joseph came here later and in honor of his nephew he built the chapel first only a prayer room got the land and the legends will say that he built the first church of Jesus let the legends be real he did the guides would tell you what happened then, the building, the destroying, the moving, the destroying, the building. All of that is here for you to see, dear ones. But the reality is this. The first Christian church honoring Jesus was here built by his uncle. And what I want to tell you that I told the other group is really not provable. It's not really known. But it is so significant. The church he built never had a cross in it. It never had a man pictured in silhouette suffering. No. Because his uncle knew that that was not the story of his nephew. That's not what he saw his nephew preach. That's not what he felt in the love that was there. His church was so cheerful, light poured in, color was everywhere. There was no depiction of the suffering man on the wood. When you go into a Christian church today, often that's what you see first. Darkness, suffering, sadness, crying, weeping. And that's not what Joseph wanted at all. He wanted the message of resurrection, redemption, and love and light for this planet to be seen because that's what his nephew was all about. And this is where it was, on the hill. And if you could see it, if you could close your eyes and see it today and feel what the intent was right from Joseph in the first construct that was physical about his nephew, you would see joy, no suffering, light, color, singing, beauty. Let it be known that this was the original intent from his uncle, from his family member. And it happened right here. This is the real Joseph, the real Jesus. Beautiful in all that it represents. And one of the reasons that this area still sings to this day more than the crystalline grid, this area sings. And it sings with the light of the master of love and all he stood for and all that was built here in accuracy and light and love was real. Go from this place knowing a little more than you did before about what Glastonbury really is about. And so it is.